Uh, and so Daniel uh, and his very own Ben Stein from the Master Publisher, and uh, he's going to talk with the work that uh, he's done in the uh, and put it with uh, a Cool, thanks. Thanks, Rob. Um, it really <coughs> sucks to speak after uh, Steve Rutherford because he, he can say a lot of what I'm going to mumble through far better than I can. So uh, I apologize. If you want to follow along, these, this, these slides are just the website, and you can just add that to my website, and um, they're all there. I also screencast them as I'm doing right now, um, and you can find links to recordings on them if you want. Can everyone see the slides fine at the back? Yeah. Um, I like this quote, and there's going to be a lot of stuff that's repeated here, uh, so I apologize. And this is one of the, my favorite quotes about teaching. Sue Rigby at uh, Edinburgh last year put this up, and I, you know, like, you know, we're not we're not in academia for for the lifestyle, right? Um, uh, you know, uh, or the work hours, or so. Might as well have a bit of fun. Um, and I think it's important that we, we we try to have fun when we teach, and that our students have fun uh, when we teach them. Um, so a lot of what I'm doing is mainly motivated because I wanted to have fun. Um, this, this course that we're now teaching our first years came from a discussion uh, with Rob as to what a mathematician is in, in, in the modern uh, day. And um, the idea being that in the modern day, a mathematician is someone who has to be able to write computer code. Um, even in the most purest forms of mathematics, you're going to have to write some lines of code now. That probably wasn't true 50 years ago, um, but but um, nowadays you, you, you have to at some point write some lines of code. Uh, I'll, I'll, I think most people in the room have seen this part from our, our Namibian visitors. Does anyone want to take a guess at what that does? It's, it's basically three lines of code, um, and it, it, it more or less does that. So it, it gives you a pretty terrible way of approximating pi by dropping points on a square and counting the number that would land in a circle. Um, it's a terrible, terrible way of, of, of approximating pi, but it's, it's neat. It's three lines of code, and it moves. So um, I, always, I always point it up. I don't think the sound's going to work, so I'm not sure if I'll even show this. But well, let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. Ha! <laughs> oh, could be because I didn't turn it on. Okay, um, as you like said, my name is Matt, uh, and I'm going to talk about why I think uh, computing should have a big role in education. I'm a mathematics student here at Cardiff, and for the first time this year, computing was a compulsory module for all the uh, undergraduate students. Being honest, when I first heard that I would be studying maths, I was a bit hesitant. Uh, I couldn't see what it had to do with some numbers. Uh, so. We started with learning uh, Python. Uh, we covered everything from putting words to begin with, to writing searching algorithms, uh, to even object oriented programming towards the end. And we did all this in a few weeks, so it was pretty intense. We then moved straight on to uh, learning, uh, sorry, to using what we had learned uh, in Sage, which uh, Vince talked about earlier. This was especially useful for me as a mathematician. Um, and from there, I was able to immediately start using those skills that I had developed in my other modules. And these are skills that are going to help me into the next four years of my degree. The coursework that we had to complete for our computing module um, was to create a report about something to do with maths, and it had to involve computing. So I chose to talk about prime number theory. Um, I used the skills that I had learned in computing uh, to create functions to check if a number was prime, um, and even to plot simple graphs in Sage to explain their distribution. Um, my knowledge of computing helped me to explain a theory that mathematicians, professional mathematicians, have been trying to work out for hundreds of years, and it even helped give me an insight into what prime numbers have got to do with the Riemann hypothesis, 
there's some you may have heard of, there's a one million pound prize for someone who can submit a solution to it. Arguably one of the most famous problems in mathematics, and I wouldn't have got that understanding of that problem if not for computing. In the space of just three months of teaching, I went from having not the first clue about what computing or coding was, and ended up with skills that will help me for the next four years while I'm studying at university. Yesterday and today, I've met and spoken with some amazing people, and I'm looking forward to learning more about computing. This is the impact that computing has had on me, and what I'm really trying to say is, why did I have to wait until university to learn this? Thank you. So to, to give that a bit of context, um, Matt was a first year student last year, and uh, he, he learned to code over uh, in, in the course I'm about to describe a bit further. And then we went to an international conference, and uh, the three students, three students from Cardiff got given tickets from the school. And this was what's called a lightning talk, because they happen a lot at software conferences where nothing's planned. You just kind of stand in a, in a queue at the end of the day, and everyone talks for at most five minutes. And so I was just sat there, you know, looking forward to lightning talks, so I was kind of fun. And also I was like, oh, one of my students is getting up. What's, what's he going to say? And then, and then he just kind of led with that. He's a very eloquent young man. And, um, and if I'm honest, uh, I would have nothing but my students here talking instead of me talking. If I'm honest, when I teach, I would not say a word, ideally. Um, I think it's very important that students take an active role. And so it's really nice um, listening to, to Steve's idea that a student is a, is a resource and not a problem. Um, and so, so yeah, uh, that's why I kind of like to show you that, that an, an idea of the motivation behind the use and importance of what students are learning. I'm actually going to go very briefly through some of I think I have to do everything briefly. I'm not sure how much time I have, so I'll just mumble along. Um, go through some of the actual software, uh, because I was speaking to, um, to Martin, Martin Jean-Baptiste, and uh, I tried to do my French accent a bit too early, and I called you Martin. Martin Jean-Baptiste and uh, Paulus earlier about, about the software. So um, there are links on the slides, and you can go to them, but these are, um, these are just websites. We... This year we used uh, cloud.sagemath, which is just a, a web-based uh, platform. The website's responsive, but it doesn't look this squashed. It's just because of the, the camera. Um, it's all Python-based. It all uses Sage, and, um, and it's free, and it's very powerful. Students can just go to a link, create an account. They don't have to install anything. And they can, for example, just use pure Python. They can use R. Um, they can do all sorts of things. I'm just running various cells. Um, and the internet might have died again, which obviously points out a weakness of it. But in general, it's fine. Right, so there I'm fitting, a, I'm, I'm using a Python package called scikit-learn. I'm just fitting a very simple linear model. You don't have to worry about these details. I'm just kind of showing you that, well, that's, that's probably the most useful that 2 plus 2 is equal to. Uh, for there I can plot things and whatnot. Um, so we teach in Python and I realize there's some computer scientists in the room So I'll, I'll say computer science 101, but hiding uh, because I'm, 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 I'm uh, Sure, they would, they would disagree with certain concepts that I try and teach um, uh, Or how I teach them sorry, and so we just say all right forget the mathematics just programming um, from, for, for about four weeks and then um, then they learn Sage which is a, um, a specific maths uh, package. And so you can, you can do things like uh, add 2 plus 2. You can solve a linear equation. Um, uh, well, sorry, uh, you can solve equations. Um, that was a mathematical mistake that I did on purpose there. Um, and you can do more complicated stuff. Um, so you can, you can create a matrix, for example. Um, And you can use that matrix to, for example, create a, a game. Um, and you can obtain the Nash equilibria for, for that um, game. Um, and things like that. And it's, it's all designed with very much research in mind, but also teaching in mind. And so there are various little things that just help um, if, you, if you wanted to. Um, so, for example, I think they've got something... 
just in there for a random walk. If I wanted to plot a random walk, it just gives out the code. No one needs to learn any code and they can just tweak the code and you get a, a random walk. Um, and then the, the final thing, um, if I go here, I might be able to see it, is it's also got a LaTeX editor. So, La so LaTeX is the tool that mathematicians use to, to write and so it's got a LaTeX editor. And students do not need to install anything on, on their computer to, to use it. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a great teaching tool because it just takes that little abstraction of, okay, you need to install this, then that. It just, just works out of the box. And that's what we use uh, for, for teaching. It's actually got a lot more teaching tools in there. You can have courses and a bit like a VLE, uh, share things around, but I don't actually use those myself. So that's what the course is. And now um, the way it's taught. It's taught in a flipped learning environment. You might have heard the term flipped class. The problem with the term flipped class is that it puts too much emphasis on the classroom and not enough emphasis on the fact that it's an entire environment where the time spent in class is just as important as the time spent elsewhere. Um, and the general idea is that it all revolves around the contact time with uh, an, a, a more authoritative figure on, on a particular subject. In general, that's me. Um, and the idea is that pre-contact time, they have the initial exposure to content. Um, they start it's, it's a constructivist framework of learning. So they start constructing their learning. Um, and the most important thing is that you start gaining uh, some feedback as to the identification of difficulties that they might have, which allows you then in contact time to, to go into a bit deeper. Um, it allows you to uh, finish off the construction of understanding and address uh, difficulties. That's, that's the theory. Uh, behind it. I like to call it a reactive way of teaching as opposed to, you know, these are my lecture uh, slides and I'm going to do these in that week and that's what's going to happen and perhaps I'll get some feedback after 11 weeks of teaching and I'll tweak something for next year, which is too late for those students. Um, I like to think of this as it allows me to be very reactive um, and and change things for the students as, as and when they come. So, this is what the course looks like. I don't know how well you can see this, but you don't need to worry about it too much. There's, there's two semesters. Um, I'll talk about the spring semester very, very briefly if I have time. But the autumn semester, students go in um, to labs and they there find they go through a binary system of assessment. Um, have they done the work or not, basically? If they haven't, or they haven't tried enough, and it's, again, it's done the work. It's not a question of, have you succeeded at the work? It's, have you really had a good go at that? Really trying to emphasize, make a lot of mistakes, and, and mistakes are not bad. And um, they're in there with uh, tutors, myself, and I'll, I'll talk about the tutors in particular in a bit. And the idea is that through these lab sessions, I'm bias via the, the, the tutors and, and obviously being there myself, I'm getting feedback as to what the students are having difficulties uh, with. And so for example, the first time I taught this course, I thought functions um, would be no problem at all for a mathematician because a function is a very well understood concept in mathematics and from a coding point of view, it's just the same thing. Um, and if I had not taught in this reactive fashion, my students would have had a really hard time with functions um, because I would have only addressed that for the next year. And because um, they indeed had a very hard time with functions and other concepts that I thought they'd have uh, an easier time with, sorry, a harder time with, they, they didn't. And it turned out it took us three weeks to go through functions as opposed to the 20 minutes that I'd originally um, assumed. So then the next year, I thought, right, I have to make sure they're ready for functions. Functions are difficult. And that particular year, functions were not a problem. Um, and something else was a problem. And that's just the way it is. That's just the reality of it. And you have to teach in a way where you're constantly gaining feedback from your students. That's the most important direction of feedback is the feedback you get from your students and change. And if you can't change, then it's too late for them. Um, so this happens on a Monday and a Tuesday in the week. The difficulty is that I then get all the feedback in time for usually late Wednesday evening, and I decide what we're gonna look at on Thursday in the class. Um, and so that is a lot more work than just having the slides, but um, I, I enjoy it uh, more. Um, it ensures I don't have to speak to my wife. Um, so um, <laughs> students, <laughs> what was that? 
Ah. <laughs> There's too many people that know Zoe here, actually. <laughs> so um, the lab sessions, the students work around uh, lab sheets, and um, I won't go into the details there, but the lab sheets are, are simple instructions accompanied with a video where I show them how to do something, and there are certain questions that are called tickable, and, and those ones are the students that um, the, the tutors will kind of go around and say, have you got any things you'd like me to check for you? And the students say, yeah, I think I've done this. And usually it's, yes, you have, and tick. And that's that binary thing. Or it'll be the student saying, I don't understand this question. And then the tutor goes, okay, what have you tried? This, 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 this. Great, you've got the tick for it. If at the end of the lab session there's time, which there isn't always, always is, then the tutors will explain it. But that's not point of the labs. The, the point of the labs is to find out what students are having difficulty with, and then that's what we go over in class, and, and uh, that's the idea. So this is what a lab session looks like. Um, they're, they're noisy, and I emphasize that they should be noisy, and so, so if, if you've had a, a discussion with a student and realize they've completely gotten question eight, and then you go speak to another student, and they say, I'm having a really hard time with question eight, you say, okay, I'll give you a tick, but go, go speak to them. And you get the students all to, to walk around and speak to each other. Um, again, this is a question I always ask. I really like this photo for one particular reason. Does anyone want to take a guess at what it is? The groups is nice. I'm not in it. Um, <laughs> I'm at the back taking a picture. I'm, I'm not the center of attention. I'm, and, and that's that's something that I really try and emphasize that I, I, if I could remove myself completely, I would. Um, there's another cool thing is that this is a student tutor. And so this is someone who did the course last year. And so I use student tutors from previous years to, to tutor. That, that's by design because it's, it's great and it, it, you know, it, it helps the other students. It helps this students for their, for their, well, this particular student is probably the best coder in the whole University, well, school, uh, so he doesn't need more help. But uh, but also, it's it's by necessity. You know, we have a large class. There are lots of labs going on. My 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 um, autumn semester, Monday and Tuesday, are basically wiped out um, because of these labs. So it, it's a, it's a lot of work. But it's also a lot of work at the moment because I don't have enough resources for these students to be tutors uh, because the first year there were no year zeros and. Uh, but hopefully next year I'll have lots of students I can tutor for me, um, which will be great. Um, so in the class meeting, as I say, we go over particular details, um, particular discussions. One class meeting this year lasted 30 minutes um, because there was one particular thing students were having a, a trouble with, so I went over it and, and that was that, and that's great. Um, the perfect class meeting is the class meeting that lasts two minutes. Everyone okay? Yeah, great. But, um, also, lots of other class meetings, they actually overrun because the students, because they had time to, to kind of absorb the stuff and know what they're having trouble with, they want questions. So, for example, one class meeting, they had a particular problem with object-oriented coding, and I built a very basic video game where two people would fight each other. And uh, by the end, the students say, oh, let's make them be able to jump. Oh, let's make them be able to do this. Let's make them be able to do that. And, and we were just doing it, and all of a sudden, kind of, one of the students just put their hand up. I said, oh, don't put your hand up. And, and you know, just my name's Vince. And, and, and the student uh, said, oh, Vince, um, there's people outside waiting to come in. I, I think you should stop. <laughs> and then all the other students were like, oh, well, let's just do that. And, and so we, we had to stop. Um, but but I, 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 I in no way believe that would happen if I pulled this class at, at the board going, this is the syntax for an if statement. Um, now go away and do it. That it just would be impossible because they would not know what an if statement is. Um, this is an, in uh, I don't have any time left, do I, Rob? Okay. Uh, <laughs> this is an indication of their engagement. And I, I haven't gone into detail too much about the ticks and the tickables, uh, but this is just, do they do work before coming to the class meeting? Yes. Uh, si simply because I, I set that as the norm. I say, in the same way that for a lot of classes, going and being geographically located in the same room as me for 50 minutes is the base participation in this course. Um, this course, the base participation is to get these tickables and to get this binary uh, marking. The way I word it is that if students do not do 80% of their ticks, 
they'll lose 15% of their mark. So it's not extra work to get extra marks. That's very important. They'll lose 50% of the mark. Um, I've taught it twice, uh, both with 150 students, and I've had to do it to one student. And, and that means it works well, because I don't want to take any marks away. I want the students to just do the work. Um, and it's also, they have to do the work at given points, and if students come and see me after two or three weeks and they're like, oh, I'm completely lost, I'm completely put behind, then I, I just have a chat with them and we figure it out. Because again, it's just, it's, an, it's, it's, it's a measurement of engagement, really. This is how the students do. In the interest of time, I won't, I won't dwell on it. Um, here's some of the positive comments we had. I used my own website uh, as a VLE and the students liked it. The videos are helpful. They like the tickables. Um, some students specifically said the flipped class is good, so it's nice that they real, realized that. Um, liked the peer instruction, we're getting to low numbers here, but in general it was the good comments, they liked the structure of the class, they liked the access to the materials, and that's, that's something I also uh, put a lot of emphasis on. Um, I think it's important that I don't make the students come to the materials, I make the students, the materials go to wherever the students are, however they are. Um, some of the I say negative comments, is it's mainly revolving around a little bit more help would be nice. So, you know, students have said, can we have an extra lab session? Can we have more tutors in the labs? Which I would love to do, uh, but, but <laughs> I have to speak to my wife sometimes. Um, one thing they said is it would be nice if a bit of the lecture actually looked forward. Um, and one student even said it would be nice if we had two lectures, one that looked forward, then we had the labs, and then one that looked back. Again, there's no time to do that. And also, I would not want to do that because that first lecture would give the illusion of learning, um, which is far worse than the absence of learning, um, which is kind of what you, you said earlier. So, so, but I have started to like five, ten minutes at this time for students. Let me say, okay, next week you're going to learn about this, which will let you do this. But I almost don't want to do it because I want the students to be Confused for a little bit. I do want the students to, to struggle with a bit of content for a bit. Um, right. Uh, I won't talk about the spring semester too much. Um, the students break out into. I'm about to. Just stop me, Rob. Just tell me to uh, The students break out into companies and they work on a whatever they want. So in, in a way, it's kind of similar to what uh, Steve was talking about. Except I don't get them to build a teaching resource. I get them to build whatever they want. I, Maybe there'll be something cool to talk about with Steve, if that's good or bad, I don't know. Um, it has, but so, some of the students um, go off and build websites that uh, teach something, and some of the students go off and build websites that allow you to calculate how you should um, share your uh, a, a, ca a taxi fare. And that, I really like this part of the project because particular companies come to me and say, Vince, we want to build this, and I say, okay, the technical or mathematical tool you want is this. And they go and learn something that not necessarily everyone in the class should learn. Um, and so it's very, very individual, uh, and that, that's quite nice. One of the exciting parts in the class is this grant council. About week six, everyone comes in, and all 40 companies, their manager gives a one-minute talk about what they, they do. And I've got one video of one of them um, that's... Keep in mind that I am standing about here at the moment with a timer about, about to turn off or talking too long. Uh, I'll just put this one on mainly because it's funny and then I'll, I'll stop. Alright, target eight, four. Number one and all, to hear the top three patterns of fucus as he endeavors to overcome the 12 constellations that surround the Earth. And that goes all from Cut to Bleak 4. In our sci fi RPG game, made into Django, you're going to help us embark on an adventure with Fugus, the 13th sign of the Zodiac, and stopping the other Zodiacs from taking over the world by fixing the sun in place. I want you to have a in and make all your decisions wisely, because if you don't, <laughs> um, we're all in great thing, but in this way, the balance isn't kept, we're all going to fall into nothing. But computers only have the hard work for 18 days. So, come on, what are we waiting for? <laughs> so he, he shoots me there. Um, so, <coughs> he, was, he was really fine, Ambrose was a great, great student. One of the students who actually came to me at the very beginning said, listen Vince, 
I do not want to learn how to program. I want to, I want to be a mathematician, um, uh, and I'm struggling with this, and I, 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 I do not want to work on this. Um, he's going to be tutoring next year. Um, he's, he's learned a whole software tool that, that is what Pinterest uses and, and whatnot. So again, uh, that was quite nice. And he was very keen to do, to do a good whatever that was. And so he came dressed as he did. Not everyone does. Um, and so that was, that was pretty good. I've got, I've got a couple of other things I could say, but perhaps I should. Okay. Um, so a couple other examples of some neat stuff. Um, now, there's, there's been some research that, that says that active learning, which is defined in this paper, is just anything that's not, you know, someone at the front that singing, basically, um, uh, does give better performance. Um, and this is a meta-study of a multiple bunch of studies, and, uh, and it's, a nice, it's a nice reference. Um, I won't have time for that. Uh, there's a nice thing that a student says about the course. Um, I can come back to it if, if people want at the time. Then there was another piece of research, again another meta study, I don't like reading the actual work, um, that looked at personality and found that the biggest predictor of academic performance is um, not intellectual ability, um, but two really uh, personality traits on a, on, on, on a number of five, I'll put them all up now. And the one that is the most, uh, the best predictor um, of academic performance is conscientiousness. And they define, my loose interpretation of conscientiousness is ability to work hard. Um, and the other one is openness. And my loose interpretation of the definition of openness is the, the willingness to learn new stuff. And so those two things are a better predictor of academic performance than, um, uh, than intellectual ability. And I... I really liked reading this paper uh, simply because it, it, it was almost like reading a slight autobiography where I, I kind of went through high school through a stage where all of a sudden there were girls and I didn't want to do any work and my marks just went down and I remember having a conversation with my mom and she said, you know, but you're a smart, bright boy. And I was like, no, nah, mom, I'm just not that smart. You know, these, these 11s out of 20 um, will we'll just do just fine. And then all of a sudden I had one teacher uh, who was extremely strict and mean. And, um, and I realized, oh, actually, if I do work here, I actually do quite well. And so just, the, yeah, it rang quite true to me. And anyway, with, a, with an undergraduate student, um, Imogen, who's doing her final year project with me, we've tried to look at this from the point of view as what's the difference in a flipped class. So these are the six dimensions that we found through a survey of all our students. Openness 1 and openness 2, we couldn't quite seem to collapse our, our variables uh, sufficiently. Where openness 1 is more of a measure of willingness to learn deeply, and openness 2 perhaps is a willingness to learn a lot of stuff. Um, this is what our class looks like. So we see the personality of our class. We see we've got, we thought maybe perhaps mathematicians were extremely neurotic, but it doesn't look like we are. Um, so. What we found is if we looked at the average mark in all the other modules they're taught in the first year, which are not taught in a flipped uh, way, that the biggest predictor of performance was conscientiousness, which is exactly what the literature says. So that's, that's kind of nice. It's like, okay, yeah, cool. Um, that's what we'd expect. Um, <coughs> not, not a great model by any means, but, but a significant one. Um, and then when we said, okay, let's just look at the flipped class uh, course, so the computing for mathematics, then, then the biggest predictor was openness, so, so willingness to go in, willingness to, to learn, which kind of fits with the model probably. Um, so this is actually quite a nice little result, um, I think, uh, because it, uh, it's kind of pointing to a, a variety of things. Um, that perhaps this pedagogic approach, um, an active pedagogic approach anyway, uh, would actually incentivize deep learning. So whilst we, we tell students, oh, you know, you've got to engage, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. If they then go off and get okay marks just because they're able to work really hard at the right time, then we're wrong. Um, but, but if we can put a pedagogic system in place that, no, to actually do well, you do actually have to, to, to deep learn, then maybe. But this is very much a, a perhaps, right? It's small data, small models, um, very much perhaps. But that's perhaps what it seems to indicate. Um, and the final thing, we've also had focus groups with the tutors who were students last year. And this particular thing, so I was removed from the focus groups because I didn't want to 
bias anything. And this particular uh, tutor, Tutor I, and I, I know exactly who he is, um, he said this, I think it's just a module that you get out of it what you put in. So all of us around this table clearly put plenty in. Um, and I think that's true, and I think from a personal point of view, what I have to be careful about is that I, I don't leave anyone behind. And that's something that I don't necessarily think I do the best job in. And that's what I have to think about. And I'll stop there. <laughs> Uh, yes, so uh, I I did have an experiment with a sort of flip system where mm -hmm. teaching third and fourth years to uh, develop youth based on audio pop. I think it's a, a fairly primitive system. Mm -hmm. I, I had a piece of material to look at. And the idea was that they should have studied after a certain point before coming to class. Yeah. And then we discuss uh, any issues that we have with the questions. Um, but I, I just found that, uh, I mean, a lot of students really appreciated it, but uh, a, a lot mm -hmm. of students didn't help. I only had 50% attendance, and uh, the ones who didn't <laughs> did terribly. So uh, I think that having a structure in place, I, 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 since then I was thinking about sort of how mm. do you manage, uh, how do you have enforced engagement, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, you've got a sort of element of that. Right? I think, so yeah. If they don't engage, they lose 50%. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 the not attending thing, and if they do terribly, right? That's, that's, yeah. that, that's the, cause that was my immediate thing. I was like, well, if they're not attending and doing well, great, you know? Um, but, but yeah, the, the not attending thing. I mean, the engagement. Though, on the flip side, I've heard of people who have tried to implement a flip class, and they've failed, and they've gone. Students weren't doing the work, so I had to lecture. And um, I've always said, well, actually, what you should have done is, if you anyone done the work, no, just sit there and don't do anything, or work out, walk out. Otherwise, you're just otherwise they're right, <laughs> because ultimately it's much easier to be passive than active, right? It's much easier to sit there and get the the illusion of learning. By someone talking at you, um, so yeah. But I think I think it was actually part of um, some the the postgraduate teaching certification we do in a group project I did with Phil, uh, where one of the questionnaires we we put in was, um, are you more likely to do pre work if you had a timetable session for it or something? And so uh, and they were. They said they were more likely to, and uh, it was basically because of that that we had the labs. But also from this point of view, with the labs. Uh, I can't make an assumption that everyone has a computer, so I have to have time for them to have a computer. Um, yeah, you, you showed the, the two graphs of conscientiousness and openness. What happens to the other variables that are, like, so for example, what happens to conscientiousness in the open, in, in the flipped learning approach? Does that diminish as a, Important variable is, is openness. Does openness just overtake it, or does conscientiousness diminish as an important? So we've done a lot of that, and Rob's looking forward to reading a lot, reading a, a, a relatively short project uh, report about it. Um, so, for example, one of the things we did is we we looked at not just the marks but the ratio, um, and what we found there that conscientiousness actually reduces it. So, so you know you're, you're you got quicker gains with conscientiousness in a, in a traditional environment than you do uh, openness in a, in a flipped one. Um, and we've looked at all sorts of things, you know, drilling down into different dimensions. The problems are our, our data set isn't amazing. Uh, and so, you know, like, you get to points where 20, 20 people in a particular data set when we've cut it all up. So there's lots of things to, to, to look at. But um, in general, we're seeing that if if you're if if you want to learn, you'll do well in a flip class. Um, if you can just work real hard, then you'll do better in um, uh, a traditional class. But yeah, so I haven't really answered your question. I just said lots of words. I'll, I'll send I'll send I'll send you the uh, the short the short report. <laughs> yeah. Um. Please, Steve. No, Steve. Oh, Steve. Um, at which stage do you. I mean, you talked about peer assessment. 
if we'd stayed there, I think we meant something like that. Where students are able to assess each other. Might be like um, literally, you know, the first one we did was, I think, four weeks into the new year, the start of the first year. So, hit them with something big and scary to start with, and my experience is that they step up to the plate and are doing really well. And the same experience I've had with this sort of approach. If, if you challenge them when they're still receptive to that, yeah. Yeah. Um, then, uh, then they really go with it. So, you give them perhaps a little exercise in class, and, um, um, and then you ask the next one to, to take on the other one. We, we give them a, the exercise to do at home, um, mm -hmm. but we give them guidance on what they're supposed to do. So we, you know, we guide them through it. That's what the video is there for. Um, and they go and do that at home. And then we go through that in the workshop and get them to, uh, to discuss ideas and things in the workshop. So the difference to how we were doing it before, which is to come up with a flipped approach, is before we were saying, Look, what we want you to do is go and write an introduction. Um, so a student who's never read an introduction before was sitting there going, oh, I'm not supposed to do that. So now we're saying, right, this is how you would do it, this is why you're doing it, these are the sorts of things you're looking for. Now we should go and have a go, and what we want to do is give them examples of how we to do it for, you know, this data set or this, this experiment or whatever else we have. Go and have a go, and then we'll follow it up in a workshop by telling you how we expected you to have done it. So tell you how to do it, have a go, and then show you how you should have done it. Rather than just saying go away and do it and then we'll see what you got it right on. So that that's the sort of the sort of flipped angle to it. You're preloading them with the information first and then seeing what they do with it and talking to them about it. Um, and that's the important bit is getting them to talk about it with each other and with you. Talk about it with each other is more important than talking about it with you. Mm. Imagine. Yeah, and no, I completely agree with that. Completely. Agree with that. I think for going back to your point about you know challenging them, challenging them at the beginning, and I think with all these active learning approaches, as long as you have some scaffolding, you know, like you could you can throw them in the deep end of the pool, whether or whether or not they know you know a life raft is there but have a life raft there um, and having all sorts of scaffolding. The way I like to describe it is that with, this, with the flipped approach, obviously it's different to what Steve's, not, not as cool as what Steve's doing with the, with the pure learning thing, but is, okay, the lab sessions should get the comprehension and, uh, and, and the general identification of problems for, I don't know, 60% of the class. Then, then, then I'll get up to 95 in, in, the, in, the, in the class meeting and then there's going to be five percent. I make sure that I have bespoke um, uh, office hours for for them. But but then I also have loads of things in place to try and emphasize. Yeah, go speak to each other. You know, you'll. I'm old, right? Like, you know, I don't know how to speak to you. Go go speak to each other. Yeah. Um, we've, we've had a lot of discussions about, you know, particularly when we talk about transition to university yeah. and the challenges we face. There was talk in the, the GA conference yeah. that referred to about whether. That transition should be smooth, or you know, whether it should, you know, not the bad start because we're clearly expecting a jump. And I think generally we say, well, yeah, there should be a jump, but there has to be, you know, support. There yeah. has to be a scaffold around yeah. that. It's not just a case of well, off we go. <coughs> it's got to be a safe down. place to fail. Yes. It's got to be a safe place to fail. And it's trying to get that environment there. Mm -hmm. Because the other problem, I think, with, with that slow increment, you know, they've, they've come from high school where they're just used to being able to do everything. And, you know, you get students that, for example, with, with some of the coding stuff we do, where they've written a bunch of code and they'll call me over and say, is that right? And, and they're not willing to press enter to find out, you know? And I say, what do you think? And they're like, I don't know. And so how would you find out? And they're like, I guess I'd press enter. And I'm like, why don't you press enter? Like, well, I don't want to get, I don't want to be wrong. Even though no one would ever know, it's just them and the computer, you know, the computer doesn't tell me, uh, but it's just that complete aversion to failure. And that, that's, if there's like one thing we could do to our students before they came, is just get them to fail a lot. <laughs> get them to, to, to normalize failure. Um, you know, not, not to like 
bash them down or anything, but just get them to just say, okay, if I get something wrong, I get something wrong, you know, and let's figure out how to do it. Yeah, to learn from it, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. And it's probably because it's the same thing. Yeah. 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 You're not in Kansas anymore. But as you say, you have to support them and students that have absolutely no idea what to do. Yeah. So can I, well, I think just as perhaps a thing, just to think thank you. Because we can continue the, the chat, the, the discussion and things you heard, it was a wonderful thing. Uh, thank you, Vince.